S-1, first space shuttle mission, first orbital flight of the shuttle Columbia. The first orbiter, Columbia, launched on the 12th of April 1981 and returned on 14th of April, 54.5 hours later, having orbited the Earth 36 times. Columbia carried a crew of two, mission commander John W. Young and pilot Robert L. Trippin. The launch occurred on the 20th anniversary of the first human space flight. If STS-1 had launched in March 1979 as originally scheduled we'd have been launched about half-trained, Young said. This involved an abort being called in the first few moments after launch, and using its main engines, once the SRBs had been jettisoned, to power it back to the launch site. The first launch of the Space Shuttle occurred on 12 April 1981, exactly 20 years after the first crewed space flight, when the orbiter Columbia, with two crew members, astronauts John W. Young, commander, and Robert L. Crippen, pilot, lifted off from Pad A, Launch Complex 39, at the Kennedy Space Center. The launch took place at 7 a.m. EST. A launch attempt two days earlier was scrubbed because Columbia's four primary general-purpose computers failed to provide correct timing to the backup flight system when the GPCs were scheduled to transition from vehicle checkout to flight configuration mode. Not only was this the first launch of the Space Shuttle, but it marked the first time that solid-fuel rockets were used for a NASA crewed launch. The STS-1 orbiter, Columbia, also holds the record for the amount of time spent in the orbiter processing facility before launch, 610 days, the time needed for the replacement of many of its heat shield tiles. The only payload carried on the mission was a development flight instrumentation package, which contained sensors and measuring devices to record the orbiter's performance and the stresses that occurred during launch, ascent, orbital flight, descent and landing. John, we can't do more from the launch team than say, we wish you an awful lot of luck. The stacks combined northwards translation and climb above the launch tower's lightning rod were readily apparent to Young. After clearing the tower the stack began a right roll to a launch azimuth of 067 degrees true, and pitched to a heads-down attitude. Simultaneously control was passed from the launch team in Florida to Flight Director Neil Hutchinson's silver team in Flight Control Room 1 in Texas with astronaut Dan Brandenstein as their Capcom. Columbia's main engines were throttled down to 65% thrust to transit the region of max Q, the point during ascent when the shuttle undergoes maximum aerodynamic stress. Overall Young commented that there was a lot less vibration and noise during launch than they had expected. President Ronald Reagan had originally intended to visit the Mission Control Center during the mission, but at the time was still recovering from an assassination attempt which had taken place two weeks before the launch. The crew clearly observed the coast of California as Columbia crossed it near Big Sur, at Mach 7 and 1,35,000 feet. Similar to the first Saturn V launch in 1967, engineers underestimated the amount of noise and vibration produced by the shuttle. Pilot Crippen reported that, throughout the first stage of the launch up to SRB separation, he saw white stuff coming off the external tank and splattering the windows, which was probably the white paint covering the ET's thermal foam. Due to the top-secret nature of the satellite, only a small number of NASA personnel were aware of this, and they had arranged for the photography prior to the launch as a precaution to make sure no damage had been done to the thermal tiles on the underside of the orbiter, as there had never been a flight of a crewed spacecraft before where the heat shield was exposed to the vacuum of space for the entire duration of the mission. Aligning the shuttle's low Earth orbit with the KH-11's polar orbit was a somewhat tricky move, and launch on 12 April was scheduled for a few minutes after the launch window opened, due to the need to get the KH-11 in the correct orientation for imaging the shuttle. Such damage would have made a controlled descent impossible, with John Young later admitting that had the crew known about this, they would have flown the shuttle up to a safe altitude and ejected, causing Columbia to be lost on the first flight. After some modifications to the shuttle and to the launch and re-entry procedures, Columbia flew the next four shuttle missions. The ultimate launch date of STS-1 fell on the 20th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's Vostok 1, the first space flight to carry a human crew. 
in a tribute to the 25th anniversary of the first flight of Space Shuttle, firing Room 1 in the Launch Control Center at Kennedy Space Center, which launched STS-1, was renamed the Young Crippen Firing Room. The song Countdown by Rush, from the 1982 album Signals, was written about STS-1 and the inaugural flight of Columbia. The footage of the launch was commonly played on MTV throughout the 1980s and 1990s, and was the first thing shown on the channel, along with footage of Neil Armstrong on the moon and the launch of Apollo 11. IMAX cameras filmed the launch, landing, and mission control during the flight, for a film entitled Hail Columbia, which debuted in 1982 and later became available on DVD. The title of the film comes from the pre-1930s unofficial American national anthem, Hail, Columbia. The beginning of the song Hello Earth, on Kate Bush's 1985 Hounds of Love album, contains a short clip of dialogue between Columbia and Mission Control, during the last few minutes of its descent, beginning with Columbia now at nine times the speed of sound. The incident did not delay the launch of STS-1 less than a month later, but pilot Robert Crippen gave an on-orbit tribute to Bjornstad and Cole.